Well, good, good morning. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Uh, happy Palm Sunday to all of you. And uh, can we welcome our orchestra, choir, instrumentalists, and our kiddos? It is a tremendous blessing to be here and to be worshiping with you, and so we're so glad that you are here, whether you're here in person or joining us online. Uh, we want to thank you for spending this time with us. Uh, my name is Mike Sedgwick. I'm the pastor here. and want to welcome you, uh, and uh, obviously it's Palm Sunday, and we're so glad to be celebrating the triumphant entry of our Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Uh, so a couple quick announcements I have for all of us. Uh, number one, in the pew racks in front of you, we have our Connect cards. Uh, whether it's your first time, first time in a long time, or you're here every week, uh, we would encourage you to fill one of those out. Let us know that you're here. And then in addition, below is a section for prayer requests. We would love for you to be able to uh, submit a prayer request, and our prayer team would love to be praying for you. In addition, we have a weekly email that goes out every Saturday. If you don't receive that but would like to know all the things that are happening at the church, you could write your email address on there, but we promise that we won't sign you up for anything unless you want to receive it. So make sure you write on there, sign me up for the newsletter, and that way we will do so. So a couple of quick announcements. Uh, in between the services today for Palm Sunday, we made little palm crosses uh, after the service. If that's something that you would really like to do, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of instructions down by the fellowship hall and plenty of palms. So uh, participate in that if you would like to do that. Also, the, on Palm Sunday, one of the things we do is we participate in a global offering that is called the One Great Hour of Sharing. Uh, in the back, there is a special uh, piece of paper that will tell you all about the One Great Hour of Sharing. Uh, there are also envelopes that if you would like to give to that, you can do that this week and also next week. Uh, being the big start of Holy Week, this coming Friday, we're going to have a wonderful Good Friday service. If you have never been, uh, it's a very reflective service. Uh, we encourage people to come a little bit early. It starts at 7 p.m. Uh, you may have noticed we have a prayer walk that is out here through our handicap accessible ramp. And we encourage people to just come a little early and read each of these little stopping points and have a time of prayerful reflection of reading about Jesus and His approach to the cross. So that'll be this coming Friday at 7 p.m. And then, of course, next week is Easter, uh, so a couple of things happening for that. First of all, uh, we're collecting offerings for Easter lilies. Uh, when, you, when I say collecting offering, you, you pay $5, and that way you can dedicate an Easter lily in memory of someone or in honor of someone. And then at the end of the second service, if you filled out one of these, uh, you get to take that Easter lily home with you. So we're not really collecting an offering, you're just purchasing the Easter lily in advance. Also, one of our traditions here at the church is to do what we call the flowering of the cross, and so we'll have a nice big wooden cross out on this top courtyard, and we encourage you to bring some flowers from home. You don't need to stop and purchase flowers. You're welcome to do that if you like, but we've had everything from wildflowers to backyard flowers to you name it, uh, and so we come and we just decorate the cross, and it's a wonderful sign of new life being brought into this world by Christ. In addition, uh, you saw some of our little kids up here. Some of them were up here at the first service. Uh, but in between the services next week, we're going to have a little egg hunt uh, that is for kiddos. Sorry, parents. Um, however, our children's director is so, she's a genius. And she came up with this wonderful idea that when you walk out and see the eggs, there are going to be some that are very simple. But she has coordinated it so that the little ones can only collect the easy ones. And the older you are, the more challenging it is, like you'll be climbing up trees or something. So uh, you won't want to miss it. So we encourage you, if you want to watch the kids run around, come early next week. We're going to be doing that right after the 9 o'clock service. And if you have little ones or grandkids, you could bring them uh, early to do that and then spend some time uh, having some coffee and a time of fellowship. Also, a good reminder that if you have been thinking about inviting someone to Easter, next Sunday would be a great opportunity. Uh, so many people have moved uh, through statistics, we have found out, that that's the number one reason why people stopped attending church is because they moved. 
And so if you're out in the community, in the neighborhood, and you hear someone say, oh, we're new into town, or hey, I just moved here, our response and reaction should be, hey, where are you going to church for Easter? Or hey, would you like to come to our church for Easter? Uh, Just a great way to invite people, as so many people as they've moved have fallen out of the habit of going to church, or they don't know a community to connect with. So I know you're all loving and kind, and so that's why I say you should invite people here. Uh, Anyway, the orchestra will also be here next week to celebrate um, our Easter celebration as well, so we want to include you to come and join us for that. Uh, Those are enough announcements, so let us continue in worship as we spend a moment in time of prayer. So would you please join me in prayer? Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you that once again, Lord, that you as the author of life, Lord, the one who spoke light and life and everything that we see into existence. Lord, we thank you and praise you that in your majesty, Lord, that you were mindful of us as the sinful, fallen, and departed creatures that you created. Lord, we thank you that through Jesus, as we celebrate this week of Palm Sunday and leading up into this Passion Week, Lord, and through Good Friday and the crucifixion, And ultimately, with the resurrection of Jesus, we thank you that, Lord, you, the author of life, tasted death so that we did not have to. We thank you and praise you, Jesus, for your sacrifice that redeemed us and made us right in your sight, that you took away the sin of the world and promised that whoever would believe would be saved. And so we thank you and we proclaim that today. Lord, we also proclaim you as our King Lord, as as the one who is Hosanna, Lord, who's come to save us. And so we thank you also, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that you have sent that the incarnation would continue so that we could know what it means to have you living inside of us and dwelling in and among us. We thank you and praise you, Father, Son, and Spirit. And we lift up this time to you that you would be glorified and praised through all we do. We ask that you would join us and increase our faith this wonderful day as we praise and worship you. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, as we continue in worship, I'd invite you to stand as we sing our opening hymn.
afternoon, everybody. Great to see you here on this soggy palms uh, Sunday morning. Please take a few moments to greet each other. Hey, that's good. That counts, right? Well, good morning, church. Happy Palm Sunday. I'm glad you're all here today. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord, we know you love us. Father, you deserve all the glory, honor, and praise. Lord, you are the powerful king who can do anything you please. And we know that whatever you choose will be good and just. Father, one thing we can never fully comprehend is the love you choose to give us. We don't deserve your love, and instead we deserve your wrath. Yet despite our flaws and failures, you still love us. Lord, how great thou art. But may we pause for a moment and confess the sins we have done to you. From John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Lord, we don't deserve anything. Yet you give us everything we need and provide it more. Lord, we like to lift up the persecuted churches of Thailand. Lord, you said of the persecuted, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Holy Spirit, may you empower all the persecuted Christians so that they may be your witnesses to the ends of the earth. And Lord, let all of your children impact the world, whether it be far or wide, or simply helping anyone who needs it. We also lift up those in the military with ties to our congregation, like Ryan Morgan Charles and Brandon Penner. Please bless and protect these military people as they fight with you and for this country. May you bless and protect all of the military so that they will stay safe. And may your children shine brightly to all their comrades. Lord, we also like to lift up those who are in need of help and comfort for the sick or grieving. Lord, you are a mighty God who sees our pain and tears. Jesus, may you give them strength to their souls so that they will put their entire trust in you and never stop singing and praising your holy name. Lord, to you alone does all our praise belong. Lord, to you alone may our hearts remain steadfast and still. Lord, may we come out of our graves like you called Lazarus out of his, so that others may believe. Help us to step out of whatever is hurting our spiritual life, whether it be doubt, fear, anxiety, depression, or anything that is stopping us from being able to fully put our trust in you. Holy Spirit, strengthen us to be devoted to you so all the world may know you through us. May we close out in prayer as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
the Presbyterian church say amen? Wow, that was cool. I think we should all try that just for the sakes we could all say we did it once. Let's all do it. Ready? One, two, three. Amen. Now, just a little more conviction. Ready? One, two, three. Amen. Yeah, I like that. Uh, You know, I don't know what exactly happened, but our Christmas stars decided to turn on today in the sanctuary. Um, We don't know why that happens. That has nothing to do with anything. It's just we came in and we're like, oh, those are on today. So I guess, you know, even the stars proclaim the glory of God. So that's a good reminder, I guess. Uh, Well, we are in the final sermon of this series called Eyewitness. Uh, In fact, if you're joining us for the first time, this is the tail end. This is the caboose. Uh, We have been going for eight weeks on this sermon series uh, through the Gospel of John, and we called it Eyewitness because John was an eyewitness to everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did. And so if you have been here for all eight I mean, you should give yourself a a, a pat on the back. I mean, that's really impressive. Uh, If you missed a couple, that's okay. Don't worry about that. We actually live stream all of our services. And if you missed one or want to go back, you can watch any of these online anytime. Apparently, they will remain on YouTube forever, uh, which is cool and also slightly disturbing for me. Um, But you can go, you can get them easily by going to our church website. It's wpcesco.com, and you can go back and you can watch all of these or share them with a friend, whatever you want to do. Uh, One of the things we said at the very beginning of this sermon series is that there are two words uh, that are so misunderstood when it comes to the church, and that is faith and belief. Faith and belief. I mean, it's so funny when we're We all understand what these words mean when we're at work, when we're at school, when we're at home. We know what it means to have faith in someone or something, and we know what it means to believe. But as soon as we bring these words into a theological context, they can get confusing. Uh, In the world, we all believe based on evidence. I mean, that's what we do. We we, we research whenever we need to make a decision. We read uh, things, we, see, we look at things, we Google things, we want to find as much evidence to help us make a good informed decision, and then we believe based on evidence. That's just what we do. The other way that we believe is that we base it on the confidence in the person who is giving and delivering the information. I mean, we all did this in school. Uh, our teacher, because we had confidence in them, told us something, and we believed it. We didn't even have to go home and figure it out and work on it. We just did. Uh, And our parents, oftentimes we said, I have confidence in my parents. What they said is true. Um, Our family just watched that movie Forrest Gump, uh, you know, and, and it's really funny. It's that mama says, you know, that's what he said. Well, mama says this, mama says that, because Forrest Gump believes something because of the confidence in the person who is giving him the information. But again, when we take these words, faith and belief, and put them into a theological or church context, they can become confusing. And some of us grew up with phrases like, well, you just got to believe. And it's like, well, I don't understand, or this doesn't make sense, or why would God… No, 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 don't ask those questions. You just got to believe. To which we said, well, that's hard. Uh, Some of us grew up with statements like, well, you just need a little bit of faith. You just got to take that one on faith. Why? I I don't understand, though. No, no, don't ask those. You got to take it on faith. Or the worst one that sometimes we hear is, well, you need more faith, as if we can just, you know, go and get some more and pull it towards us. The point is, in the real world, in real world experiences, We know what it means to believe something. We know uh, what it means to have faith in something. And what is so intriguing about this whole series is that John, the disciple named John who wrote the gospel of John, or dictated it more likely, he says that faith and belief do not take on special meaning when you bring them into the context of Christianity. In fact, he writes his entire gospel around this idea, and he says there were these specific events 
that took place in the life of Jesus. And he calls these events signs. We would call them miracles, but he calls them signs because these signs point to something. They point to some one. And he says that these signs are actually evidence, evidence for you to believe something. And that is that all of these point to who Jesus was and that he, who he claimed to be was true. And so he says, don't, don't skip out on faith and belief. Look at the evidence. Look at what I saw. Look at what I heard. I was an eyewitness to all of this. And he writes it down for this exact same reason. And we find out at the end of the gospel that John has an agenda, an agenda for me and an agenda for you. That he says, I wish you could see all that I saw and I wish you could hear all that I heard. So I'll write it down so that in some way you can see it, you can hear it. And his hope is that the conclusion he came with was that he believed that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that whoever believes would have life. And he said, my hope is that you too would come to that same conclusion. So we've looked at all of these signs. Uh, The first one we looked at was that Jesus turned water into wine, Perhaps the strangest sign because nobody knew about it. It was a secret. Only later did people find out what had happened. And we found out that that sign pointed to that Jesus, as he showed up on the scene, that there were these old empty water jars that they used for purification in the Old Testament. And he says, I am bringing something new. Fill these with something wonderful and new and refreshing that will be the best that has ever come. The second sign that John records is the healing of the official's son, which was kind of peculiar because Jesus did it remote control. He wasn't anywhere near the person. And he said, go, your son will be healed. And what we found out about that is Jesus has this fascinating statement. He says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you won't believe. Which when we read, we have a tendency to think Jesus is like, Unless you don't see signs and wonders. But he's saying, no, this is true. I understand you. Unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. So let me show you signs and wonders that Jesus too knew that seeing is believing. And then the third miracle was the healing of the paralytic at the pool where Jesus told him to pick up his mat and walk. And then he gets into all kinds of trouble by smacking the hornet's nest because it was on the Sabbath. And what we find out is that Jesus and God are one. He proclaims that. And that Jesus has divine authority. And then from there, Jesus goes on to feed the 5,000, where we have this wonderful miracle of so many people seen. And he claims to be the bread of life. And he says that you will find fulfillment in Christ alone. Jesus continues, and we looked at the story of the woman who is caught in adultery. And the lesson that we learn from there is uh, that John proclaims is that Jesus came full of grace and truth. We try to balance grace and truth in our parenting with our coworkers, with our employees. We try to be somewhat grace, somewhat truth. Jesus came full of grace and truth. And when he tells the woman, does anyone condemn you? She says, no one, neither do I condemn you. And go and sin no more, both grace and and truth. Then two weeks ago, we looked at the story of the man who had been born blind. And the big question was, who caused this person to be blind? Was it something his parents did or something he did? And Jesus said, neither. And it introduced a new category to us, that somehow God can use illness and sickness for his glory. And then the man, after he was told, you know, Jesus put mud on his eyes, he didn't know how Jesus made the mud. Maybe that was a good thing, but Jesus spit on the ground and made a little bit of mud and covered his eyes to say, look, we are blind. We have spiritual blindness. And when the man came back saying, seeing, he said, I once was blind and now I see, which is the story of so many of us that we too would admit that there was a time in our life when we were blind But now through Christ we see. And then last week was 
Perhaps one of the greatest miracles and signs that Jesus did was the bringing of Lazarus back from the dead. And there he proclaims, I am the resurrection and the life. Seven signs, one message. Believe. So, Last week, we ended with this wonderful passage of John, and I just wanted to bring it up here really quick as John chapter 11. In a moment, I'll have you open up your Bibles to John chapter 12. But last week, we ended with this, that after Lazarus had been raised from the dead, John says that therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in Him. And it's like, praise God, thank you. It's finally happening. They see and they believe. But not everyone was thrilled. John records that some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And the chief priests and the Pharisees called a special meeting of the Sanhedrin, all of the religious leaders together. Even though they disagreed theologically, they all came together to oppose Jesus. And they said, what are we accomplishing? Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, as if they had anything to do with what Jesus was doing, everyone will believe in him. And it's like, hallelujah, that's the point of it. But they had their eyes on the wrong prize. And then the Romans will come and take away our temple and our nation. And ever since that time, following Jesus has cost us something. It has cost us to follow Jesus. We have to say no to some things and yes to other things. So today, we are jumping in uh, to John chapter 12. If you have brought your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to open up to John chapter 12. If you didn't bring one or if you don't want to use your app, whatever you may have, there's pew Bibles in front of you, uh, or of course, we will have it up on the screen. And so the, the Pharisees, I'll catch you up while you're turning there, are unhappy about this, and so the leaders decide to set the trap. They decide we've had enough of this Jesus movement, we've had enough of these signs, Jesus is, a, is causing a ruckus, he might cause an uprising or a riot, we need to put an end to this. And Passover is approaching, and they know that everyone will return to Jerusalem for Passover. And so they set the trap And they send spies all throughout the city to look for Jesus, that as he comes into the city, they'll receive reports. Now, in case you have to leave early, I just wanted to give you the punchline up ahead. There are no more signs. Someone after the first service said to me, what was today's sign? And I said, there there was no sign. There is no more signs. Well, there is one more. Jesus does save the best for last, which we will be celebrating next week. But today, there are no more signs. In fact, it's really interesting. Jesus, after this, uh, he, he, he hides. He goes into hiding. And John spends 11 chapters going sign after sign after sign, saying, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. And then he spends the last nine chapters of his gospel focusing on this one week, the last week of Jesus' ministry here on earth. So in case you need to leave early, this leads up to one of the clearest sermons that Jesus gives. And I think John does it intentionally. He says, all of these signs lead to this critical moment. All of the pre-Easter events, it leads up to this. And Jesus, in maybe again one of the clearest times, He's just going to tell us this truth. He says, Anyone who believes in Jesus will be saved. You need to get that. And he tells everybody he can. Jesus and God are one, he will say. And what I think is amazing is you will hear the desperation of Christ. Desperately wanting all of those who hear the message, including you and I, to believe. So John chapter 12, it begins right after Lazarus has been raised from the dead. Uh, You know, what do you do in a situation like that? So, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Again, what do you do after this? Well, you throw a dinner party, apparently, right? 
Uh, so here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. It's like, hey, this is awesome. Let's, let's celebrate what Jesus did. And all of the family apparently goes right back into their normal states of being. Martha serving. Lazarus was among them reclining at the table. I mean, wouldn't you love to go there and be like, what was it like? What did you see? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? I mean, what was it? Lazarus, tell us. And Mary took on her role as well at the feet of Jesus. Mary took a pint of pure nard. And in case you don't know what a nard is, I certainly don't. It was an expensive perfume. I'm glad John added that so that we knew. And she takes this perfume and she pours it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, a pint of perfume, that's 16 ounces. I mean, ladies, could you imagine? I mean, this is not a... This is 16 ounces, you know, of two water bottles worth of perfume and pouring it and wiping his feet with her hair. And John gives us this very obvious statement. The whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. I mean, I'm sure the whole neighborhood was filmed was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And you might think to yourself, why in the world would she do this? What is Mary doing? Well, you wouldn't be the only one asking that question because one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. We would be in the same company of saying, what are you doing, Mary? I mean, Judas didn't like it either, but John, knowing that we might get stumbled up on this passage, he jumps in with this little editorial comment. He says, uh, why wasn't this, Judas says this, why wasn't the perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Now, just for fun, I googled what is the average salary in Escondido. Uh, yours might be more, yours might be less, according to whatever website I found, .gov, whatever. It said the average salary in Escondido is $92,000. Imagine for a moment that I came up with an idea that next week the church would all pitch in and we would buy something worth $92,000 and I would just dump it out. Now, may, that, you know, we'd be like, what are you doing? Like, why? What a waste. What are you doing? Let's just say that maybe John was uh, extravagant and exaggerating, that it wasn't really 92000 What if it was half of that? 46000 We would still be like, gosh, that's a, that's a lot of money to just dump out. What if it was half of that, Twenty-three, Or what if it was only 5000 still? It was an exceptionally generous offering to Jesus that Mary brings. Now again, this is where John jumps in with his editorial comment. He says, Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it, which finally allows, gives us the answer to the question, Judas, where'd you get the new sandals? Now that actually doesn't ever happen in Scripture. I just made that up. But you know, it's like if he was constantly dipping into the money bag, I mean, what, what was he doing? I don't, I don't know. But you can imagine, and, and they, John goes on to explain that this was a gift and a preparation for Jesus' burial. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only to see Jesus, but also to see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. And at this point, it's like, hey, it's happening. People are seeing and they're coming to, they want to know, Lazarus, you're real. It happened. What was it like? They want to know. They're so excited. And we've talked about this a couple of weeks. We are often caught up with a willful blindness. That the people of the day, that they had a willful blindness as well. That is, there was something to see, but they did not want to see. There was something to discover, but they did not want to discover it. And these people are filled with this willful blindness. And, they, you know, it's, it's like, hey, I want to see, but I don't really want to believe. And those who were caught up in that the most were the chief priests. And what I think is one of the saddest passages in Scripture 
is this chief priest's response, is that in response to so many people coming and seeing Jesus and Lazarus, the, chiefs, the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. We've had enough of this Jesus movement. And if Lazarus is going to bring people as well, well, we just need to kill them both. I mean, it's terrible. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Now, what's happening at the same exact time is Passover is approaching. And again, everybody knows that Jesus is coming into the city. Everyone is so excited. And in fact, the city is full. It's full of Jesus fans and it's full of spies waiting to spring the trap on Jesus. And of course, everyone's mind in Passover is thinking that there was once upon a time that God showed up and God delivered the nation from bondage of the Egyptians. And maybe one day there will be another Passover where God would show up and deliver us once again from bondage of Rome. No idea that Jesus was showing up to deliver all of us from the bondage of sin. And perhaps this was the Passover as there was so much momentum behind Jesus, so many people just throwing themselves saying, maybe this is the day that Jesus will declare himself king. And so they all know that Jesus is arriving in the city and they're all showing up in advance. And it says that the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. This is it. The moment is finally arrived. And so they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, which translates as, Oh, Lord, save us. Please, Lord, save us now. And then they begin to quote Scripture to him from Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then it got political. Blessed is the king of Israel. Very inflammatory language under Rome's occupation. If you begin to declare someone as king, there could be an uprising, there could be a revolt, a revolution, and riots. Very dangerous for everybody. And in fact, the last time that they wanted to make Jesus king was after the feeding of the 5,000. When Jesus discovers that they wanted to make him king by force. And Jesus immediately intervenes and squashes that movement. He pushes the disciples out into a boat. He dismisses the crowd and he goes up on a mountain to pray by himself. And once again, Jesus squashes the momentum of this political movement as well. Now, I don't know how this played out. Perhaps somebody was sitting around saying, hey, maybe Jesus will be king. Well, you know what? He needs something to ride on as he comes in as king. And maybe a whole bunch of people got an idea and put out horses and said, maybe he'll pick my horse. I mean, we don't know how it actually worked. But as Jesus walked in and people shouting, blessed is the king of Israel, of all the animals that he chose, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. At which point the energy was significantly dampened and the enthusiasm tempered. The donkey king? Really? The donkey? Kings don't ride in on donkeys. Kings ride in on horses. It's an animal of war that you come in, especially to take over Rome. In fact, maybe you will remember that in Revelation chapter 19, it's depicted as Jesus riding in on a horse, as a powerful horse, a horse of judgment and war. But here, Jesus picks the donkey, very deliberate. I am not a king of war. I am not a king of politics. I am not a king of uprising. I will be a king of peace as he comes into the city. And not just between Rome and Israel, but for all of the world and their relationship with God. And what is so amazing to me is that as he does all this, many people, because they had heard that he had performed the sign, went out to meet him. And it's amazing. They begin to believe, and they're like, this is it. Finally, all of the belief is coming. 
In the Gospel of Luke, though, Jesus tells a parable. And of all the names that he could have selected in telling this parable, Jesus chooses one of the main characters as a man named Lazarus. You may remember this parable. That there's two men. There's a very rich man who lives a very wealthy lifestyle. And outside of his gate is a poor man, a beggar, by the name of Lazarus. And coincidentally, these two men apparently die on or around the same time. And the rich man, as Jesus describes, finds himself in a place that Jesus calls Hades. And he is suffering much torment in this terrible place. And apparently there is some type of invisible barrier that prevents the two from getting to one another, but they can talk to one another. And the the rich man who's down in Hades looks up and he sees Lazarus sitting next to Abraham. And he says, Lazarus, help me. I'm down here in torment. And Lazarus and Abraham say, hey, there's sorry. There's nothing we can do. We cannot bridge this gap. And so the rich man cries out again from Hades and he says, please, I beg you, Lazarus, send Lazarus back to life. Send Lazarus. I have five brothers. Send them to my family. And let Lazarus warn them so that they will repent and not come to this place of torment. And what is so amazing is that Abraham and Lazarus respond. They said, if they didn't listen to Moses, if they didn't listen to the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone comes back from the dead. He tells us that parable and John concludes that Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in Him. And yet, the surprising yet, after having seen so much, heard so much, they still would not believe. I mean, what does Jesus have to do to get them to believe? Which leads us into the final message that Jesus gives. Again, there are no more signs. He's about to go into hiding and spend the rest of these nine chapters with his disciples and then going to the arrest and the cross and finally the resurrection. He knows his time has come. There's only one more sign on the cross. And when I read this, what I think is I hear Jesus' desperation his desire for all of those who were there to hear and to believe, and also for us to believe as well. Maybe you'll hear the desperation as well. Again, he knows he's leaving and he speaks so plainly. Then Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but the one who sent me. The implication here is so simple. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen God. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. You want to know what God would say? Listen to Jesus. You want to know how God would respond? See how Jesus responded. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. Believing in Jesus is believing in God. Honoring Jesus is honoring God. Praising Jesus is praising God. And putting your trust in Jesus is putting your trust in God. And then once again, he goes into his strange little talking about light and darkness. I have come into the world as light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. You will be set free and have life. And then Jesus brings this statement that not many of us think about. If anyone hears my words, but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. Wait, what, Jesus? If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person? I mean, Jesus, I I, I thought you were judging people all the time. Uh, Jesus, when, you know, 
all of your interactions, the religious leaders, the, uh, the, the elites, the Pharisees, I thought you were judging these people all the time. What about the people who were the deniers, those ultra-religious people? Weren't you judging them? No, that's not why Jesus came. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world, which is the message from the very, very beginning. Even from the very beginning, John the Baptist points at Jesus and says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then later, as Katie prayed, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. The entire gospel centered around your believing in Jesus. But before you go too far, and before you start to think, oh, finally, Jesus doesn't judge me even if I don't listen, He says, there is a judge. Don't be, don't be thinking incorrectly here. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. In fact, the very words I have spoken will condemn them on the last day day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. It's so fascinating. Jesus is like in this moment where he sees the two sides. He sees all of humanity living in this world, and then he sees all of eternity. And it's like he's standing right in between them saying, look, please, please, you as on this earth right now, please believe these words. Hear me today, because one day these words will come up again, and everyone will believe them, but not everyone will be happy with the result. And then later, Jesus would prove it. He would prove exactly this. I know that His commands God's commands lead to eternal life. And He proves it on the cross. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Again, Jesus is done with the signs save for one. He says, please, please believe. And ever since then, we have had to do what people for 2,000 years have done. Walking by faith not by sight, but instead relying solely on what John saw and what John heard in his gospel to give us this statement of belief. And as we've listened and said so many times, John writes at the end of his gospel, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. And so we walk by faith and we join all of those on Palm Sunday so long ago who said, Hosanna, Hosanna, please, Lord, save us now. And blessed is the one who comes to save us in the name of the Lord. Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Palm Sunday, Lord, and that it was the beginning of this holy week. Lord, and as we will find out through celebrating Easter next week, Lord, this is the capstone. This is the foundation of all of our faith, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, that anyone who puts their faith in you and trusts in you is also putting their faith and trust in God. And so, Lord, we, we, we want to believe that, Lord. And I just pray for all of us, Lord, that if there are areas where we don't believe, Lord, I pray that same prayer that was said to you so long ago, help us with our unbelief where we do not believe. Heavenly Father, we thank you also for John that he captured all of these signs so that we would have proof and evidence that you, Jesus, truly are the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And we thank you, Lord, for your wonderful gift for all of the world and for specifically 
us today, Jesus, as we proclaim you as our King. We give you great thanks and pray all this in that name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as we conclude our service, I invite you to stand as we sing our closing song. As a quick reminder, we don't collect an offering here. Instead, we have a box that's in the back. And so if you filled out one of our Connect cards or came prepared to give uh, a financial gift to the church, you can put that in the box in the back. There's also home group questions, offering envelopes for one great hour of sharing, and information on Easter lilies all available in the back. Uh, In just a moment, there will be a postlude. And I don't know about you, I'm sticking around for it. Uh, Where else can you get such incredible music every single week for free other than at the church? I mean, praise God. Thank you, and thank you all for leading us today as well. Uh, But for now, receive our Lord's blessing. And now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance to you and bring you peace as we go out into this world serving our King and being salt and light wherever we go. So may God bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy Palm Sunday. We'll see you here next week for a wonderful Easter celebration.